Master Your Mindset Radio, Episode 35. Welcome to Master Your Mindset Radio, the show where we empower you to conquer limiting beliefs and transform your world with your gifting and purpose. Now for your host, Elizabeth Nader. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the podcast. I am so excited to have all of you here. And you know what? Today's episode is an incredibly important subject. It's one that I feel everyone should tune into, everyone should listen to, educate themselves about. And I'm so pleased that Diane Grossman has chosen to join me on this podcast. Diane, can you say hi to everybody? Hi, everybody. Thank you so much, Elizabeth, for having me. Today. Absolutely. I'm honored to have you here. I truly am. And guys, if you don't know Diane's name, and, and many of you do, especially people in New Jersey, but let me just tell you quickly who she is. Diane Grossman is a fellow New Jersey mom, fellow business owner, mom of four kids, and specifically mom of Mallory, who she lost tragically to suicide almost three years ago as a result of bullying at the young age of 12 years old. So that story had national attention. I know many people know Diane's name when I've said her name to others. And some of you may have heard the story and not realized you know, what it was all about. But I am so honored because I got to meet Diane and uh, get to know her a little bit. And we decided to do this podcast. We'll tell you all about why, but because her movie is, has just come out about Mallory. So Diane, take us back a little bit. I want you to get the audience on the same page about your experience uh, with Mallory. I know it's a long story, but kind of tell us what was happening that led up to June of 2017 with Mallory at school. Sure. So, you know, I always try to describe Mallory first, just to let people know that, you know, the reason why we began to speak out about all of this was because I felt like if this could happen to a child like Mallory, it could happen to anyone's child. Um, I also want everyone to know that suicide is one of the leading causes of death for children ages 10 to uh, 24. And so, but the funny thing was, is that was never in, in my mind. I take it back to about fifth grade is when we started to see problems with um, two girls. There were two girls that decided that for no reason, we weren't friendly with them before. Mallory didn't have a relationship. We were actually new to the school district. We had only lived here about a year. And um, these two girls just kind of decided that they didn't like Mallory. But then there were days that they did like Mallory. And I think that that's what was so confusing at that time is that Mallory began to want to be a part of this group of girls. Sure. And so we saw it, we started to see problems in fifth grade. And, um, but then we were ending, you know, it was kind of ending. And I was one of those moms that was like, well, kids are going to be kids. And I would try to tell Mallory, not everybody, not everybody's going to like you. It's you focus on the people that do like you all of the normal, you know, it's okay to not be liked. It's okay not to have right. friends and right. things like that. So um, and then all of a sudden it was sixth grade. And I think we were really optimistic about sixth grade because I told Mallory that, you know, you get to meet new friends and all of the elementary kids come together. So we were very optimistic about sixth grade. And turns out that these two girls had made friends with other girls. And there was almost like this squad that was developed, this group of girls. Mm -hmm. And um, they would basically, to say, they would just kind of take turns making fun of Mallory. And it was the little things. I, I think that when we think of bullying, we think of it as this one big episode or something that happens or the big kid is attacking the little kid at the locker. And that's really not what happens in every day. I would say middle school bullying. It was the kicking the chair when no one's looking. It was the eye rolling. It was the snickering under your breath. It was flipping the hair as you're sitting behind her. Little things like that, those subtle little ticks all day long. Um, and these Mallory would come home and I would email the school and you kind of think, well, this is at the time you think of it as just normal everyday growth of a child. You, you hear that all the time, you know, right. bullying has been around since the beginning of time. So you don't think of it. And as a mom that's going through of it, you don't think of it as bullying in that sense, right. but then, so it just kind of continued. And then on June 13th, um, we were wrapping up, you know, you're kind of wrapping up the school year. And my husband and I'd had um, several conversations about taking Mallory out of school, possibly homeschooling her. 
we talked about going and looking at some private schools. So we were kind of having those adult conversations to kind of figure out maybe this wasn't maybe a large middle school with 900 kids wasn't the place for Mallory. Maybe she needed a smaller environment. But Diane, this was also after like nine months of you talking to the school, right? It's not as though you were just do, dealing with this at home. You right, were consistently... right. I, exactly. Exactly. Mallory would come home with an incident, you know, her lunchbox would be full or she would come home and say that one of the girls called her a fucking bitch at lunch. And, wow. you know, it really just disturbed her. And, and, and of course, I would respond. I would either call the school or I'd email and you're, but it, I, I really try to point this out because when you're living it and you're in the middle of it, you really, as a mother, try mm-hmm. to minimize what's going on because you don't want to blow it out of proportion. Sure. I think, I think that that's such a key point. What, what was going on with us is that I didn't, you know, I didn't pitchfork the school. I didn't do those things. I really tried to minimize what she was going through because I felt like if I blew it out of proportion, that would make it worse. Sure. Of so course. I, and every mother does that. Well, it's really not that big of a deal. So as you're go- sending the emails and you're talking to guidance, you're, you're kind of in this mindset of, oh, they're going to fix it. They're on the same page as I am. Right. You know, you feel like as, as a parent that the school administration, when they tell you, hey, I'll look into it, that they're looking into it. There's right. a trust factor. There's a, res- a, a level of respect, mutual, that they're the professionals. And so when I did report it, or things did go wrong and they told me that they were looking into it or they're going to speak to the girls. I trusted that. And to me, that was like a, a checkbox in my to-do list of mom. Okay, I took care of it. It's done. Right. They're supposed to help you. Exactly. Right. And you trust them. I think that that's what's so important that goes on with so many parents and school systems because they are in a, in a position of authority and they've done this for so long as parents there's a level of such respect that when they say, and I grew up in that era, I grew up in the era that if your teacher said that you were in trouble, you got in more trouble at home than you did, right? So I grew up in that. So I kind of brought that to the table that when the teachers or the administrators or whoever said they were dealing with it, I trusted them. What I didn't know is that a lot of, there was a lot of sweeping under the rug going on. And it wasn't until the end of the school year on June 13th that I learned about the cyber component that it really, it began to ramp up. And that is come, ramping up to that day, really what what became, uh, what is unique now, I think, to this generation. Because I think, you know, I remember being bullied in school and coming home and, and, and my mom telling me all the things you tell your daughter, right? They're just jealous. They're just yep. mean. It's all... And all those things. But they, they made a point in the movie, and we're going to talk about the movie um, later on the podcast, but a point was made in the movie that, you know, the kids nowadays are getting this at school. Mallory's getting this at school in all these different subtle and, and also not so subtle ways. And now because of technology, she's coming home to what should be an island, an oasis away from that bullying. And because of technology, it's really with her 24-7. So talk about when you found out about the cyber aspect of it. Right. So I think also, in addition to the cyber component, let's think about their, so at that age bracket, the only thing that's important to them is what their peers say. So, you know, if your peers call you fat and ugly at school and they continue that abuse when they get home, there's never a turnoff switch. And you automatically believe what your peers say and you never get a break from it. So you're listening to what your peers say about you 24 seven. There is something that's really weird um, with these kids, it's called, you know, this fear of missing out. They really feel like if they're not on 24 seven supervising what's being said about them online. And that's what I think kids feel. Mm, wow. They feel empowered and they feel like they need to go into these rooms, these chat rooms, these platforms of others. And they're supervising. Well, what is so-and-so and saying about me? Are they, do they like it? Did they give it a thumbs down? Did they give it a heart? You've got to think that the kids really do go in and kind of micromanage all of this. Um, they're all everything about their social media. And so they are on they are on with their friends 24 seven. There's never a break. They never have that quiet space at home to just let them just be. And when they're not online, they're worrying about being online. And you know what's really interesting about that, too? And, and, and I, I, I think and again, I'm referring to the movie, but just just the way I've gotten to know sort of, you know, seeing your family in action and seeing you guys and all of this. It's not like Mallory is coming from a bad situation. It's not like Mallory is coming from a broken family. It's not like she's coming from parents who are verbally abusing her or telling her that she's, 
you know, less than she can. She's coming from a cocoon of love that that it's very apparent to me from a cocoon of parents who are responsive to her needs, who are doing everything they can that they believe they can do, who are helping her to have the right mindset towards all of this. Yet, if that can happen to her, she is still so concerned. She's 12. She cares about what her friends think and that for us as parents to understand Yes, we have to create that environment and thank God that you and, and your husband Seth do that, but it's not enough when it comes to the influence of the friend group. Well, I think that and that's exactly it. And that's I think that's kind of why we began to speak out is that we thought if this could happen to a child like Mallory. But I think we also as adults and as a society, we think that the weird kid gets picked on at yeah, school. We yeah. think when we think of bullying, we have this image of, and I, I think what we forget is that, first of all, no matter what you do, and, and again, I'm guilty of it as a parent, you want to make sure they wear the right shoes, they have the right sweatshirts, right. they have the right leggings, they, they, they're, in, they're invested in all of these activities, they're out there, they're social, they're doing, you can do all those things, but no matter what, you cannot prepare your child enough for what could be, handed to them at school. And, and I do believe that there are kids that are the bullies. And I, and I will say this, that hurt people hurt. So yeah. this is never an attack on those children because er, again, if every child could be a victim, then we also have to open up the conversation that every child could be a perpetrator. Right. And, and if we as adults can just accept that and realize that our child could be a victim and our child could be the person actually doing that and, and not, let that be any kind of a reflection on our parenting, but just a reflection on the child's experience and how we have to work together to make sure that our children are protected because we have to have the conversation on both sides. Absolutely. Absolutely. So take us to that meeting on June 13th, uh, almost three years ago. Yeah. So June 13th, Mallory had sent me a, um, Mallory called me and said, um, you know, what time are you coming home? And I could tell at that time there was something, you know, there was a something in her voice. And I'll take you back earlier on June 5th, and I talk about this in the movie. Um, Mallory had had been talking to me about how she didn't want to go to cheerleading, and she was starting to the, have these problems, and that these two girls were planning on cheering also. And so in this time frame, we'd been kind of having some awkward conversation about how she was not like she was feeling more attacked by these girls. And so on June 13th, Mallory called and said um, that she had a bad day at school and I had, I got home and um, I could tell she wanted to talk. I could tell that, you know, she was just having a really bad time. And so mm -hmm. as I'm making dinner, she's telling me how that day um, she didn't have a seat at lunch. And, um, and there was a lot of conversation around the lunch, lunch room, um, where, whether Mallory had a seat, whether, um, it was assigned, there was just, it was really, it was confusing. So this particular time she said, I didn't, I couldn't find a seat. And she tells me that she went to three lunch tables to try to find a place to sit. And everybody told her no. Mm -hmm. And again, this is so important for parents to understand because a lot of times, just because your kid's not involved in the actual bullying if your child participates in the exclusion. Yes. I always say if one child, if one child had spoken up and said, Mallory, you can sit here, it would have made all the difference in her life that day. Oh my gosh. Whether whether it would have helped her, whether it would have, you know, prevented this, I don't know. But if one child would have said, Hey Mallory, come sit with me, just spoken up. But a lot of times kids don't do that because if you ask kids who the bullies are in school, they know who they are. Sure. And a lot of times the kids are just glad that those kids are picking on someone like Mallory and not them. So oftentimes they sit back quiet because they don't want to speak up because they're afraid it'll happen to them. Of course, of course. So I, I point, you know, so I point that out so that as parents are listening to this, they can be mindful of these circumstances. Right. So as Mallory's telling me how she didn't have a seat at lunch and how she had a really bad day and she had um, gone to the lunch room lady that was kind of supervising the room and Mallory said, um, you know, can I go to the library? And she said, and Mallory, you clearly had not eaten because it was minutes into the lunch period. And she said, what's wrong? Can't you find a seat? And Mallory said to her, no. Now, keep in mind, supposedly the entire lunch staff was supposed to know that Mallory was having a tough time at lunch right. because there was months of emails leading up to this and conversations leading up to this. 
And so she gave Mallory a hall pass. And I, I really do believe that was the kind of like defining moment for Mallory where she probably went to the library and began to contemplate her life. I think mm -hmm. that was, um, and then as she's telling me this, she asked if she could eat dinner in her bedroom that she wanted quiet time. And um, so I did, I, I, I could sense that she just needed to be alone. It was almost like she had unloaded on me and she needed time to kind of go to her room and just reflect. And right. so I knew things were odd and I knew something was up, but I, you, again, you'd never let yourself go to such a dark place. Right. And Mallory had never attempted suicide before. This was not, it was just not in the realm of our conversation. But as a little bit of time goes by, I said to Seth, I, I said, go check on her. I knew that she needed a softer person than me. You know, maybe daddy could get something out of her. Cause you know, I always tell parents, you know, use that sixth sense that you have, you know, when something's up yes, with your child, you yes. know, when something's just not right. Right. And so I sent Seth up and, um, that's when she came down crying and she showed us the, um, the pictures. So the girls had taken, one of the girls had taken Mallory's picture at school during school hours um, and, um, without her permission and then posted it on Snapchat and they wrote, you saw the images, poor Mal, you have no, and you have no friends mm -hmm. and, um, and posted them on Snapchat and Mallory doesn't have Snapchat. So the girls screenshotted the images and, and text them to Mal oh so that she gosh. could see what was being said about her online. And I remember in Mallory's cell phone, she said, take those down. And the girl wrote back never with a bunch of smiley faces. Oh my gosh. And I, and that was on, um, on or around June the 2nd. So when Mallory was talking to me on June the 5th and when she talked to me on June 13th, like she just, I think she wanted to open up. I just don't think she knew how. Right. Um, and I don't think that I was asking the right questions. I didn't know how to probe rather than saying Mallory, you know, instead of saying, how was your day? And she would say, fine. I didn't know how to ask open questions to get her to start talking, to open up to me. Right. Um, I assumed that Mallory was resilient. I did not um, realize that that's a learned behavior and that it has to be coached and it has to be taught and it mm -hmm. has to be, you kind of have to emphasize it as an adult. I didn't realize that I just automatically assumed that I could say things like, well, Mallory, don't worry about it. Those girls are just jealous of you. Right. And so, um, it was that evening I took the pictures that Mallory showed me and I emailed them to the school and I said, we'll be there the next day yeah. um, for a face-to-face -face meeting about everything. The, the meeting then was actually on the 14th. Right. It was actually on the 14th. Wow. We had, okay. Yeah. Yeah. So it was a, a pretty, pretty traumatic day. Yeah. Um, we had, um, I got Mallory up and I got her dressed and we took our um, older daughter, Carly, to school and um, dropped her off. And then me and Mallory and Seth met at the school and um, we had about a three hour meeting where Mallory really did testify. And I use that word deliberately testified about what her life was like at school, because I think that's what it was. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's a room full of adults and one child. And again, I didn't understand the gravity of what it must have felt like being ganged up on by all of these adults. She had right. her mother, her father, her guidance counselor and the principal. So the most authoritative people in her life were drilling her in mm -hmm. questions. Mm -hmm. And I, I say testify because she really was the victim in that. And we treated her like a victim. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I, in hindsight, I would, I don't think it was a smart move to put her through that type of a meeting. I think right. that it was too long and it was, she probably should not have, we should have cut it very short. Um, but I think the meeting was necessary. And I think that it was, you know, our time to try to express to the school exactly what was going on and the gravity of it, right. you know, of, of how it was wearing on her. You know, if Mallory's arm was cut off, we would all create a tourniquet and we would start, she would be bleeding to death and we would be doing our best to keep it. But invisible wounds, you can't really see the gravity of how deep they are because they are invisible. And as adults, we've got to step out of trying to fix everything and first assess the situation and see how vulnerable these kids are, especially when it's nine months. It's like domestic violence. Sure. You know, if you're told every day that you're worthless and that no one likes you and that you have no friends, Imagine hearing that five days a week for nine months. Wow. Of course, you're going, your self-esteem is going to be lost and you're not going to know how to rebuild yourself up, especially at the age of 12, where you can't think about what tomorrow is because the frontal cortex of your brain is full, not fully developed. So she had so much against her yes. during this time. And I point those things out so that the parents that are listening to your podcast can really understand the gravity of what bullying does is it destroys your 
your soul. It destroys your self-image. It breaks you down little by little, just like domestic violence. So the important thing to understand is that kids at that age, like you said, they don't have the ability to see beyond that. They don't have, I think in the movie, you said something about, you know, well, we're getting close to the summer. Why couldn't she just, okay, the year is going to be over, summer's coming, but children don't function that way. What is in the moment? What is in front of them is everything to them. Right. And I say to people, they say that, you know, some of the signs for suicide is they're not making plans and not making future plans. That's just not true, especially Mm. for children. Children can in one minute, because they're impulsive, And they're not thinking about tomorrow. And oftentimes in suicide or self-harm, let's not forget about self-harm because not all children who hurt themselves die. Um, But in this in this self-harm, they're only thinking about stopping the pain for that moment because they live in the moment. And so they're not thinking about it as so. Um, after the three hour meeting, we brought, we brought Mallory home and, uh, my husband went to the office for just a little bit. Um, cause that's what small business owners do. That's the, the other side in all of this that I say is that, you know, we, we're both working full-time parents. We own a small business. And so you're juggling so many things. So, so whether true. you're working, whether you're working and not working or it, it, it's tough being a mom, especially when you're parenting in a digital world, a world that I didn't grow up in. Right. I didn't grow up in a world So I don't know how sometimes to parent in a digital world. I I don't necessarily understand the gravity of how painful it is. I know how it feels now when people say negative things about me or the foundation. Um, You know, when people say those things, I know how that makes me feel. I can't imagine how that would have made me feel at 12 if I had negative things said about me. So uh, we brought Mallory home and um, I made her her favorite meal. She loves SpaghettiOs. Mm -hmm. And um, we ate and we talked about... um, cheer, you know, cheerleading practice that night. And she knew that Carly and I were headed into the city. Carly was going to get to see the show because she had just performed at the cabaret at school. And so this was kind of her ninth grade. I made it through ninth grade. Um, and I would try to do those things with my kids. I would try to have, you know, date nights with them. And Carly was really into Broadway in during that time. And so, um, and Mallory was going to go off to cheerleading practice with her dad. That was her time to get to, for him to see, you know, that part of her life. And um, so we kind of had future plans. And I, I remember curling up with Mal um, in her bed. I knew she was, I knew she was sad and I knew she was just feeling really depleted. And I knew that there was um, a, a lot going on. I could just see that she was really sad. Yeah. Um, you know, I could just see that she was, um, and I was actually hopeful that she was going to go spend some time with her dad. And he's such a soft person for her to talk, for him to talk to. And I thought, well, maybe she'll open up and, sure. you know, and I had promised her that she didn't have to go back to school. I had promised her cause the, um, principal after those three hour meeting, the principal's big solution to Mallory's problem was to give her uh, a poker chip and ask her if she was all in. And he put all the responsibility of the behaviors that she was receiving online and at school on her shoulders that she she had to be all in. And I I just, I remember thinking, why would you give her a gambling analogy (laughs) and in in gambling? Only one person wins and and you, you risk it all that you might win. That's just such a, a, it's such a, and he explained to us the, the, the giants, uh, guest speaker that had spoken. He was a football player and he came up with this all in mantra. And I'm like, yes, if you're building a soccer team or building a gymnastics team or building a football team, everybody has to be all in to win. But when you're dealing with a kid that's being verbally abused every day at school, maybe not asking them if they're all in because maybe they're not all in. Maybe they, they're ready to throw in the towel. Maybe they've had enough. Maybe nine months is too much. And so I just remember leaving and, and knowing that she, she, like I felt the same way that yeah. it was just, and so, um, we talked about all of that and, um, I, the, I left with Carly and I called Seth and he was on his way and, um, and he called Mallory at five Oh two to grab her gym bag that he would just meet her outside. And that was pretty typical again for us. It was right. very, nor- very, nor- everything up until that point was normal. Mallory right. answered the phone and he said, Hey baby, it's daddy. You know, I'm on my way. And she said, okay. And he said, grab your gym bag. I'll meet you outside. And you know, it, it was just everything up until that second was so normal right. in our life. And, um, he pulled up into the driveway and she wasn't there and he came running into the house and 
ran through the house. And, and again, she was a big chick jokester. So she would hide in cabinets and yeah. she would hide in closets. And so he started looking in cabinets and looking in the basement and, you know, screaming for her yelling. And he called her cell phone and he heard her phone ringing upstairs and he thought I was just in her room. Mm. And that's when he went in the closet and he found her. Right. Right. And in the movie, which I hope everyone listening to this watches this movie, um, there's a lot more of specifics related to sort of what you guys went through. I know that in the movie, yeah. you're sitting in her bedroom for probably one of the first times, as I understood it since, right? Isn't that one yeah, of the that's first true. times? Yeah, we okay. had never opened, we had never opened her room to anyone before. And um, after the funeral, I just walked into her room and I just closed the door. Mm-hmm. And um, I just, I it was, you know, just a part of the house that I, I just, it I just had to close the door. And so we didn't go in there for almost a year. Um, into her room. And I remember when we opened, opened her room for the first time to sit and do the interview inside her room, we sat on the edge of her bed. The bedding was still there. Mm. Um, the towel was still on the floor where, when Seth was trying to give her CPR, where she right. had, um, had gotten sick and, and the fluid and stuff. It was just, it was such a traumatic moment. And we sat there for the first time, just the two of us. And that was the first time that Seth had shared intimate moments that he had experienced um, with Mallory and what he went through, um, in the movie, when we did the movie. Yeah. It's yeah, incredible. In movie. Incredible yeah. that you guys do that. I mean, it, I could tell, you can tell it's palpable that this is sort of the first time that it's happening that way. Right. That it's being discussed yeah. that way that he's sharing in that way. And, um, it was both rough to watch and the same time, I think necessary and, I, I, I'm not sure where your mind and your heart was at that moment, but it's a very important piece for everyone to see, to make it again, this could be my child. This is not an odd situation. This is not somebody who's out of the norm, so to speak. If this can happen to Mallory, it can happen to my child. We have to remember that. Right. And that's why we did it that way. It was, it was a tough decision. Even Seth kind of was not totally on board when we decided to do that. But I I thought, well, I have to, I I hate to say this, but I have to break the audience. I need them to see the gravity of what happened to Mallory. And I'm only doing this because, you know, they, the the statistics are one in four children are bullied at school. If suicide is the second leading cause for cause of death for children in New Jersey, it is the leading cause of death um, in many States. And, in the country as a whole, it's the third leading cause of death. Suicide is really important. And I, I wanted to release the film during this time because we need to, number one, understand our children are spending way too much time online between the online learning. There's nowhere yes. for them to go. So they're spending a lot more time online. And we decided to release the film because I wanted people to see that while we're focusing on the virus that's going on, we also have to be mindful of what's going on with our children online and the isolation, the exclusion that they're having to be forced with. We have to be talking about the mental component of what COVID is doing, the online bullying, all of these things and what our kids could be going through. Right. It's, important. So it's very important. So as we're recording this podcast, because this will live out there in the internet forever, we are in the middle of this shutdown. We are in the middle of this pandemic. And I know you had shared with me that there were other plans to release the movie and you had been accepted into a film festival and all of this stuff of course has gone on hold because of the virus and because of all the changes but you know before you did the movie take us in your heart in your mind and 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 really from you're going through this incredible trauma and this credible tribulation and it's this loss that and anyone would say is probably number one on the list if losses could ever be ranked in terms right. of the stress and, and in terms of the trauma. So you're going through this tribulation, this trauma, and in the movie, a friend of yours um, whose son, was it her son was friends with? No, it's her, it's a Kati. Um, it's okay. Kati. Um, she, um, her daughter was best friends with, Ma- That's uh, right. with Mallory. Her That's daughter is right. Bianca. Yep. Bianca's, Bianca's mom says to you, um, you know, you, you kind of said, I don't want her to become the poster child. I don't want that. And she says, but she is, and yeah. and you're strong enough to do that. So take us really into your mindset from the trauma of all of that and then to where you've ended up today and Mallory's army and all these things, the movie, like how has this process been for you? 
Well, I, it was, it's been, it's, it's been a roller coaster and it's been kind of this, this up, uphill battle. And of course you crash just a little bit because you're trying to grieve during all of this. And it was the day after Mallory had Mallory died and Kati was sitting in my backyard and she, we were talking about all of this. And I, I, there was a lot of emotions going on. First of all, you're embarrassed Mm. that your child hurt themselves. Like Mm. I can't explain why, but you're mortified that your child has done something physically to themselves. So there's a level of embarrassment there. There's a level of sadness. There's a level of that. You don't think people are going to be compassionate. You know, if your child is sick with cancer, there's this, this, love that comes over you. But when your child hurts themselves, people are confused by that. And so I, because I was feeling the same thing, I, I still was in a level of shock that I had just never experienced before. And so, um, Kati said, you know, you have to speak out about this. And I just remember saying, "I, I don't want her to be the poster child. And she said she already is. And at that moment, there was more than 5,000 people talking about Mallory Grossman, the cheerleader that had hurt herself. And it was already kind of like this news story. We had, we had news reporters going past our house. And I Mm. think the reason why is that in 2017, the CDC had released a report that suicide was on the rise, that there was a 50% increase. Like they were really starting to talk about teen suicide because they were starting to see it increase just in that moment. Right. Um, that, that they were really starting to see us peak, if you, if you would. And so there was a lot of that going on. So the growth of the foundation and the strength of that really came more from the community mm-hmm. of this people coming together going, I've got you, you just do what you do. Mm. And, you know, I had people buying t-shirts when we didn't even have t-shirts. And I think when you have that, especially as an entrepreneur, that drive kicks in of, of, of trying to, and then all of a sudden you realize that there's this community of people that are saying me too, my kid was bullied. Oh my God, my kid. I, I feel like during that time, because it was Mallory, people somehow gathered the strength to start sharing their stories and their frustration. And this, and so once you have that, so all of a sudden I wasn't alone. Mm -hmm. I, all of a sudden I realized that a year earlier, two students in Butler had committed suicide. And then all of a sudden I learned that there was a student down in Tom's river and it just grew and grew and grew. And I think once that happened, that kind of gave me the strength Mm -hmm. to tackle on something that I knew nothing about. I was also I guess you would say I was angry Mm -hmm. and I was frustrated. And so I felt like that, that, that fear, frustration, anger, all of that was fuel for me to push forward and create a foundation. Um, and I, and again, I didn't want parents to feel the way that I feel. Um, and I think that's what's happened. I, I, um, there was a woman that was on a, one of those like mindless television shows and she had lost three children. She had four children and she had lost three to this genetic disorder. Mm. And she said something. And I, I remember watching this and going, I'm sitting here worried. And I, I lost one child, but she lost three and they were all under the age of 10. And she said something that stuck with me that moment. And I've always kind of just taken ownership. And that was my aha moment. She said, those who lose the most do the most. And she raised millions of dollars for this genetic research to save children. And I think that that's really what was my aha moment. Those who lose the most do the most. And Mm so I kind of let that be my mantra. um, And it's my way to just make a difference in the community. The community did so much for me. It's my way of giving back to the community that loved me. The way you describe it almost feels like you got pulled into it a little bit because of the need. You suddenly looked around you and ironically with an entrepreneur's mind right we we fix problems we fill we 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 bring solutions we we address needs right because that's what you do but right. if you have that mind and people are saying no you don't understand we need your story no you don't understand we need to hear about this because she's not the only one and so maybe being pulled into that a little bit until you really came to the end of yourself and said wait a minute I need to embrace this. And so you then you start to push forward on your own sort of your own energy and we cre- you create Mallory's Army, which is the foundation, right? Yes, Mallory's Army. And then the movie comes out of that. How did the movie start? So the Miller movie was kind of like one again another entrepreneurial moment, not for money, money right. sake. Right. It was never the drive. The, the drive was I was getting emails from Finland. I was getting emails from Sweden. I was getting emails from Canada, California, Missouri, Colorado. I was getting emails from all over the world, Australia. And then I, I remember saying to my husband, it was really overwhelming. I was like, how am I ever going to be able to reach all of these people? 
And I said, we have to use technology. And it was a sleepless night. And I came up with this idea. I, I said, we should record what's going on. Mm -hmm. And I said, there should be a documentary about this and a documentary, not just about Mallory's life. I didn't want to just tell her sad story over and over and over again. I wanted there to be a lesson for us, a movie that could be shown in schools all across this country, all across this world. And that was really kind of the inspiration behind the movie was for it to be something that parents can sit and have family movie night watch the film, and then have a thought-provoking conversation with their kids. And yes. so that they can have, so it op- to me, the movie opens up incredible dialogue with your children. Well, you absolutely pulled that off. I can tell you that. it. Uh, I, I just, everyone listening, um, we are recording this just a couple days after the movie premiered on Vimeo. And it'll be there until April 26. And then I'm sure there'll be other ways and we'll just have to keep people updated. And at the end, Diane will give you know her Facebook information or whatever she can so you guys can track this. But right now, as we speak, um, you can rent it on Vimeo and it's $22 to offset the cost of making this. But I can tell you that it came out Friday night at seven o'clock. We were all sitting around, all six of us waiting for this, seven of us actually. And we did watch it as a family. I, I We did watch it and we did turn it off and discuss it. And so I want you to know that you have achieved that and that this film is going to change lives because it beautifully tells the story of Mallory in a way that makes you feel like you knew a little bit about her, but it's not just that. It's also what the struggle was, what the what the challenges were. What you know, you start to learn about. Well, why didn't the school help more? What what went wrong? And start to see things through the eyes of these children. So in the movie, Diane, you it has some clips of you speaking at schools, and I know that you you do that whenever people need you to. That you're available for that. But you're, you're talking to kids, you're talking to teachers, you're talking to parents, you're trying to change their mindset, you're trying to teach them about resilience. And you said this word over and over again, and it's a word that I now associate with Mallory's story. So you said earlier in the podcast, resilience is a learned behavior. Talk about what you mean by that and why it's so important to teach it. Well, so resilience is something that you and I learned, and I always give this analogy that uh, through our experience. So we first thing is, is we have to learn how to have relationships with people who don't like us. And I think that that's really important Um, on the playground through socialization. We find things called common ground. Mm -hmm. Common ground is you like pizza. I like pizza. You like candy. I like candy. You like Netflix. I like Netflix. Oh, my gosh. We have something in common. We are now more likely to defend each other or have some kind of a, a, at least a social atmosphere around us because we have common ground. That's generally found. Our children at this age bracket, they're not as social. They think that they're social because they're online and they're engaging and they talk to one another. But because there's no emotional human connection, a lot of times the resilience, the ability to let things not bother you, That's learned. That's a learned behavior. And you learn it through your experiences. It's like if your kids never fall down and skin their knee, when they do fall down, that's why they're they're distressed. They don't know how to handle it. Whereas a child that has fallen down multiple times, they're like, oh, this is how I get back up again. And that learned behavior. So through that, because our kids are online, the ability to build resilience and build relationships with people. So if at school, they, the kids don't like you, but after school, they're, they're, you have to play with them on the playground or you have to play with them outside. You kind of learn barriers between one another. That's just not learned today. Right. And so you kind of learn through your life experience falling down. That's how you build resilience. And our kids are just not experiencing life that way. It's why we say, well, don't let those kids bother you or just ignore them. They're jealous of you. It's why that everyday language doesn't work. Doesn't work. They're, because they're always worrying about it because they're always engaged with them. Think about it like this. The kid's cell phone, it's where they hang out. It's their roller mm-hmm. rink. It's mm-hmm. their mall. That's it's good. that. Yep. What happens at 9 p.m.? What happens at 9 p.m.? The mall closes. Yeah. So their cell phone should close. They should not be in a social setting with their with their peers all the time that's right because they they need to be able to let someone talk about them and it not bother them they've got to learn that they can't just 
be expected. And so resilience is a really important thing that not only do we talk about it from resilience, but also emotional intelligence. There's a lot, you know, we're starting to hear that the Ivy League schools are starting to um, adopt emotional intelligence. Mm. Emotional intelligence is resilient behavior. The ability to not worry about what someone's saying about you or doing, you have to, that has to be learned. It's like empathy. We're organically born to be empathetic. But if no one shows us empathy, how will we ever be, have empathy for someone else? Right. Um, there's tons of emotional studies that show that children that are loved and comforted and felt good, they're emotionally happy. And a child that just sits in a crib is never talked to, never engaged. That child will lack empathetic skills. And yes. so we know that the human interaction is needed. And by the way, we're experiencing this this lack of human interaction. And it's the number one thing that we're complaining about during this COVID you know, this right. pandemic, one thing that we're saying is we're having to do meetings through Zoom and we're realizing or through Skype and having this, we can't sit across the table from one another. And so that really is tapping into that and being able to be resilient. That is something that we have to practice. It gets better. And the older that we get, the better we are. We have to give our children the time and also give them the teaching skills um, that needs to be infused in not only at school, but at home as well. So everybody needs to be a part of this. Our kids need to understand it to the degree that they can, the age that they are. Our, pa- our pa- as parents, we need to teach it and understand it and model it. And the school system, the educational system, they have such a massive influence on our children and they have them so much of the time and that they need to know that as well. And as I watched you teaching and standing in front of these people, you know, you said something that really stuck with me and I, mm. I, I repeated it back to my kids after we turned off the movie. And I said, you know, um, I said, I, well, I called you Mrs. Grossman, but <laughs> I said, Diane said. <laughs> That's okay. Yeah. Um, she talked about how, what you feel about yourself and how yeah. you see yourself needs to come from within inside inside of you not outside of you I mean you said it I'm paraphrasing you but it it struck me because as in even what I do uh, as a mindset coach and helping people as adults you know we we are so many broken adults right it's not like right. we magically heal from all of this and there's so many stories about that and I see so many people that don't understand how to reach inside and define themselves and so they are almost like this in the wind you know just flapping in the wind of opinion of those around them and and whoever has said the last thing to them and and allowing all the voices which there are so many now tell them who they are and that really is a lack of resilience as well Mm -hmm. so i i think that that being able to do you feel like the kids pick up on that when you say that to them in the school setting well, I, I do. I, I think I, what I say to them is the affirmations of who you are and what you want to be in this life. And it's about who you want to be in this life. Um, don't come from the outside world. They've got to come from within. Yeah. You know, you've got to be able to, but we've got to remember that it's not enough just to post a Facebook meme saying you've got this. Yeah. There, We've got to behave our way to the life that we want. And I will say that again. We've got to behave our way to the life that we want. And yeah. By the way, that doesn't mean that you wake up every day jumping up and saying, I'm going to conquer the world. Sometimes behaving your way, and I know this for me, especially for parents that are grieving or struggling right now, sometimes I, the big accomplishment is a shower. Yeah. Well, on those, days that, that, on those days that I can barely get out of bed, and I have those days, mm-hmm. and they're more frequent than I would like for them to be. But sometimes my big accomplishment that day is a shower. Yeah. And then after I've taken a shower, I celebrate that because that is a milestone. Rather than focusing on that I've been laying in the bed all day feeling sorry for myself, right. I turn around and I, I celebrate. And then I give myself permission to be sad, to be broken. And then by doing that, I wake up the next day and say, okay, today, not only am I going to take a shower, but I'm going to answer those emails or mm-hmm. I'm going to make a few phone calls. Right. We have to behave our way to the life that we want. And that's the same thing with our children. It's not enough for our children to say in September, I'm going to have straight A's. There needs to be goals set in place. Mm-hmm. There needs to be systems set in place. And we have to set our kids up for success. And that might mean that they get up 15 minutes earlier so that they can go to school clean yes. shaven and by clean shaven, you know what I mean? Like yes. brush their teeth, brush right. their hair. They have to put their best foot forward. And when I say these things to the kids about behaving their way and that when they look in the mirror, rather than seeing all the things that their peers have said, maybe they can sometimes see the one thing that maybe their mom or dad said, right? We don't realize that kids might have a hundred people, but love them. 
But when they have six that hate them, they're going to focus on those six. So the hundred that love them have got to understand how important those six that hate them are in their lives and help work them through how painful this is. That was a sobering thing to hear. That was a sobering moment in the movie because I think that was when the, I think the therapist might have said that, right? That no matter, the best families, the best, you know, I love you, I love you to your child. You know, you're great. You could do anything and all those things. But the voice is coming from their peers, I say to parents, when we say, I love you, you can do this. You're so, you're special. You're all this. You know what children hear? They hear Charlie Brown's teacher voice. Want, 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 want. They don't hear that. But when they hear at school, you're fat, you're ugly. They hear that. Then all of a sudden they're like, those are my peers. They feel like their peers are telling them the truth. So whether they're good peers or bad peers, their peers are being truthful. They're being real with them. Whereas parents are like, well, you're just saying that you love me because you have to, you're my mom, or you've always loved me. Mm-hmm. They don't understand the gravity of our love for them. Right. You know, right. We, we, they, our children don't have any idea because they're not parents themselves. So they can never understand how much we truly, deeply adore them and would do anything. Their focus is their peers because that's the world that they live in. And by the way, that's the world they want to live in. Yeah, of course. I don't want to hang out with my 70, you know, 70 right. plus year old mother. Right. You don't want to hang you want to hang out with your peers. When you go to lunch and do things, you don't invite your parents. You want to go with your peers. So we have to understand that that social circle is so important to them and to them growing up as to be, you know, healthy adults. It's it's not good enough just to say, it's not enough just to say to them, don't worry about that. Don't, oh, they're just jealous or this or that. So we need to give them and teach them that resilience and those coping mechanisms to be able to live in that and still see themselves correctly. It's almost like we're denying the truth by saying, well, don't think, don't worry about what they say, honey. But but mom, I care about what they say. You know, a child n- normally doesn't say that back to you, but that's their world. And we forget that very easily. Right, right. And by the way, not all children who, you know, hurt themselves, you know, die from it. And I think that we need to also think about that, yes. um, that, you know, there are plenty of children. And I think that that's what's going on. And that's the reason why we decided to release the movie so that, you know, while parents are doing this online learning and they're frustrated and their kids are spending a lot of time, maybe this is an opportunity to sit down and look at it and have healthy conversations. And maybe if a child is watching that, they can turn to their parent and say, mom, I feel like Mallory. Yeah. And if, if a child can say that, maybe it can open up. Maybe they are being bullied online. Maybe there is something going on and that gives them the opportunity gives them the say, yeah, me too. Absolutely. So this is a great time for everyone to to have access to the movie. So what is the easiest way for them to do that? So the best way is to go to our Facebook page. That's the most active. Um, You can go to our website, which is malloriesarmy.org. And that's M-A-L-L-O-R-Y-S. A-R-M-Y, malloriesarmy.org. Um, that's our face, um, our website. You can mm-hmm. go right to it and click on there. Um, but you can also, if you're on Facebook, you can go to Mallory's Army um, and click the link and the uh, Vimeo link is right there. Uh, and, it, and I did it myself. I even paid for my own movie because I wanted yeah. people to, ex- I wanted to see what it was like to purchase the movie. So I went on, I clicked the link. I used my PayPal account and it was done very quickly. And I do like to share that, People have expressed, um, why is the movie $22? There's a lot of financial responsibility Absolutely. with with self-producing and self-distributing your film. So we pay Vimeo to use their platform to stream the film. Right. Um, and that's pretty standard with all, all uh, streaming services. That's why they're only, you know, that's why these streaming services are free to you because the distributors, we are self-distributing the movie. Right. Um, but more importantly, 22 represents a very important thing for me is Mallory's birthday, which is coming up Wednesday. So April 22nd is Mallory's birthday. She would be 15. And so we chose the number 22 um, just to represent her birthday. And this is our way of giving to the community um, and something that hopefully can change their lives as much as it's changed ours. And as, as sad as our journey is and as painful as it is, I am so proud of the work that we do, and I'm so happy to be invited into so many families' homes to share our story. And if you walk away with one little sound bite, we know that we've done our job, and we know that we've done good in the world. And that's really the way that we honor Mallory with her little mantra of living a bracelet kind of life. Yeah, and that, that talk mm-hmm. about that mantra because that is this is how you're you're changing people, pers- you know, child by child, parent by parent. But talk right, about right. what she used so, to tell you with that bracelet. 
Yeah. So she was actually really fu- She was actually a very funny kid. And I, I said that she had this really dry sense of humor and she really did beat to her own drum. Mm-hmm. I mean, she was just, she was very artsy and, you know, um, I'll share this. She was a very sensitive child. And I share this because um, sensitivity is the number one characteristic for ch- children who self harm. Mm. So Mallory was a very sensitive child. If someone told her that, you know, they didn't like what she was wearing or something, she would take that to heart. She yeah. would wear the weight of the world on her sleeve. So, but anyway, she was a really funny kid. And, um, my husband and I were sitting at the kitchen table, um, and, uh, working as we, as we often did. Mm-hmm. And, uh, she was very comical and she just looked and she saw how hard we worked. And she said, I don't want a life like that. And we really joked about it. And we thought, okay, I've got one that might go to Harvard and I've got one that's going to live in my basement the rest of my (laughs) life. And it was, it was kind of funny. I was like, well, what kind of life do you want Mallory? And she said, I just want a bracelet kind of life. And my husband and I both kind of looked at each other and we're like, oh my God, Uh, what is she talking about? And I said, what are you going to do? Mallory, are you going to sell bracelets and follow the Grateful Dead around selling tacos? (laughs) It's a true story. She was like, who's the Grateful Dead? And (laughs) then I, then I thought to myself, oh, you're a horrible parent, but yeah, um, so she just talked about wanting to sell these homemade crafts and these artisan style things. Like she loved making hand scrubs and bath bombs and bracelets. And she loved taking jeans and turning them into pocketbooks. And mm. she would take a long sleeve t-shirt and stuff it and fill it and make a dog bed out of it. I mean, mm. she was just really crafty. And so she wanted, and she called it living a bracelet kind of life. And she would just wear a little homemade bracelet on her arm. And she said it reminded her to be the good in the world. It's almost like you and I used to tie a string around our finger to remember to pick up milk and bread and cereal. And, you know, but her, her reminder was something that was physically on her body. And the interesting thing is, is after she passed away, you know, we always had that mantra in the back of our head. But then we started doing research and realized there was actual case study associated with children's behavior and something as simple as a bracelet on their arm Mm. to remember and the influential children. So we have infused Mallory's mantra into our life. It's not just enough to put on the awareness bracelet, but what are you going to do with that awareness bracelet? Like, is it a reminder? And there's been times that I've been driving in my car, frustrated at traffic and, you know, I'm ready to dart around a car or get angry. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden I glance down and I see that band and it really has reminded me to live life a little softer, especially in these times. I'm, I really am enjoying the time that I have with my family, this downtime of sleeping in and not really having a place to go and, (laughs) you know, not able to spend money and not able to do, it's really grounded us. And and I'm really, am appreciating this and, and definitely Mallory's mantra of living a bracelet kind of life. And so we've adopted that and that's, that's what we do. Well, Um, you you said that it's about changing behavior. So you look down at that bracelet and you change your behavior. You're, you're reminded of what that really means. And then we change our behaviors. And I, I agree with you. I think this time is a gift. I, I think it's, it's challenging. And I think it's, um, you know, there are times when we're all kind of like, uh, but I think if we look at it correctly, it is a gift for all of us. And I think the film coming out right now is amazing. And obviously, you know, it's, there's a lot more to the story that I I just urge everyone to rent the movie for so many reasons. And, And there's so many more details in the story that will help you understand everything in a, in, a, in a broader context, but also the opportunity for that to be discussed. So after the 26th, um, you're not sure yet what's going to happen with the movie, but I imagine there will be other things down the road. Well, our, our goal in all of this is to create some attention and so that we can attract a bigger distributor so that hopefully we can host it on Netflix or be able to turn it into a teaching tool that we can um, offer to the school systems. So the more people that watch it at home, that validates it. You know, those Google analytics, those numbers are really important to techie people. They will understand the more people that validate it. And that's what we're doing right now. It's really kind of an opportunity to review the film. And we've gotten such great feedback. Um, from people that said, wow, it's not what I think, what I thought it was going to be. It's not just about Mallory's death, but it's more about our life. Yes. And I say that our, because we're a community, you know, Mallory's army, what we stand for is to empower children, educate parents, enrich schools and enhance communities. And that's really what the film does is it talks about not only what Mallory went through and how frustrating it was, but more importantly, what are we going to do next? And that's the reason why we uh, licensed the song Afterlife from Ingrid Michaelson. Yeah, because that's really what it is. We are the afterlife. We're the ones that continue on. And 
yes, Mallory passed, but what do we do now? And that's really the message that we want to give to families right now is, yes, this is a difficult time, but we are the afterlife. What are Mm -hmm. we going to do next? How are we going to get out of this? You know, without change, there are no butterflies. Yeah. Right. And so we can, we can be in our cocoons right now, but look how beautiful we are going to be when we emerge. We might be about eight or 10 pounds heavier. (laughs) There's no doubt about that when we emerge from this, but I want everybody to know that imagine and imagine listening to this podcast five years from now to Mm. think about what are we going to, what do we do? Where did we come out of this? Um, I think Mother Earth has given us a gift and it's time for us to embrace it and really come out of something so beautiful. I agree with you. And, you know, a a butterfly goes through difficulty to come out, right? Right. A butterfly has to push. And we all know that story. If you cut a cocoon open and make it easy for the butterfly, the butterfly can't fly because the wings got no strength. So we know that that is how nature replicates itself in our lives. And uh, I agree with you. So I guess here's my last question for you, because I could talk to you forever. And Me too. Um, it's just so it's got so so many aspects that are so helpful to people and so important. And I guess I just wonder when you think about Mallory and everything that's happened right now, and I know there is so much ahead of you and so much influence you will have and so much ability to continue to change lives. What would you say to Mallory today? What would she feel as far as you can know based on who she was? And what what do you think that conversation would look like? I always say that my well, first, I always say that my, my most important thing is I just miss her every day. I yeah. just the things that were taken from us that we will never see. Um, it's just it's crippling as a mother. But I often say that doing the school presentations what the most important thing, how amazing would this be is if after I get through telling Mallory's story or after the movie, Mallory comes walking out. Mm. What a gift would that be that it could say that this is it. So I often just miss her life. I just yeah. miss her. I miss her life. But I think that if Mallory and I do believe that she's watching us, I, yes. I do believe in it. I do believe that she's guiding us and little God whispers. I think that she'd be very proud of us. And I think she wants nothing more than for us to learn from what happened to her and just to make sure that it doesn't happen again. And I do believe she's guiding us. I do believe that she's spoken and said, you know, this is, and think about this there, when, when children die in car accidents, seatbelt laws come out of it. When, when, when a child dies from cancer, the research that went into that child's cancer helps another child. And so that's what I keep in, in my mind is that, you know, God promised us a quality of life, not quantity. Mm. And so that drives me. Mallory is living an incredible mm. life right now. And I always believe that. And I even say that in the movie that she's living the life that she was destined to live and she's living the quality of the life. And so I just I have to remember that as her mother and as the faith that's in my heart and soul yes. that we are just she's living through us and that we are ch- touching lives, changing lives and making a difference. And I think that's so important. Beautifully said. Well, I, I send you a very big COVID-19 hug. <laughs> Thank you. Right. Back to you. From, from our isolation to, to yours, abs- we send it to you. Absolutely. And um, I, I just admire you and I am inspired by you. I oh, can't, I can't you. wait to watch and see what God does with you and your giftings and all the things that you probably never even knew you were so good at that are coming out of you as a result of all this. I believe the film is opening a lot of doors and I really, you know, put that intention out there about the film. I really think it's going to open a lot of doors and, you know, um, who knows where you're going to be a year from now with all of this. But as we all really, you know, I think people really understand purpose. We understand that purpose means that you change at least one life for the better. And right. um, you can certainly say that you have done that. So I, I just appreciate, appreciate you sharing this much. I want everyone to go see the movie guys. And Diane gave you all that contact information. And when, um, people are actually able to gather again, I'm assuming you're still, you're still doing speaking events when you can. We will, we will, we will. Um, there were several schools that we had to cancel, so we'll reschedule them. Um, we let everybody know that October is anti-bullying month. And so if schools are interested in hosting us, I know it's hard to make that decision, Uh, We will work around the clock when everybody is ready and we're back to start taking reservations. We will start working with schools so that we can start bringing our stories and our assemblies to schools so that we can enrich their environment and teach them how to live a bracelet kind of life within the school. That's awesome. October. So, yes, absolutely. Anybody who's listening who can 
start to get those things scheduled, they should reach out to Diane before her calendar gets completely full. And I'm sure it will be. So thank you again so much. I, I just appreciate your time. I appreciate the story. I send you a lot of love and I know so many people will be touched by this. And we just all want you to continue to walk in your purpose. And uh, you are definitely living a bracelet life. So thank you for everything, Diane. Thank you. We'll talk to you soon. And guys, you know what? I, I just uh, encourage you to go watch the movie. It's on Vimeo. Don't hesitate. It's there till the 26th. You know, it, it will grow and it will it will probably be available somewhere else down the line. But now is the time to take advantage of this time that you have with your children. I know that we can all sort of get frustrated and, you know, we're dealing with online school and this and that. But when you step back and look at it, what a gift that we have. Take advantage of that. This film could change your children's life. You may not even know some of the things that may be going on that this film may bring out in them. So please go to Vimeo, rent it, and absolutely take advantage of watching it. And we will see you guys online and talk to you next week. Thanks, guys. Thank you for listening to Master Your Mindset Radio. Before you go, if you want to be part of a free online community of like-minded individuals for support, resources, and inspiration as you conquer your limiting beliefs and pursue your purpose, go to elizabethnader.com slash community. That's elizabethnader.com slash community. Or search for Master Your Mindset Academy private group on Facebook. Looking forward to seeing you online.